And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher in the Los Angeles area. And this, of course, is all of the above, your home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our world of education. Thank you so much for joining us. If you are new to the show, we hope you appreciate what you see or what you hear if you are listening on the go. All of our previous episodes, of course, can be found at aotashow.com. A lot of dope interviews, a lot of dope coverage of dope stories. You don't want to miss that. So definitely dig through those crates and um, get your learn on, get your learn on. Jeff, speaking of learning, we are almost at the end of this school year and, you know, According to reports, kids have learned nothing. They've gained nothing. It's, you know, all that stuff. But I think but, they've gained learning loss, man. Well, they've, they've oh, yeah. only learned learning loss, which is why we have to measure the learning loss. That's that's what it is. I, I think you are correct. And actually, I think yes. we should I think we should do some more testing to really get to the bottom of this. So I'm, I'm picturing a summer of testing. I don't know why we don't test in the summer, Jeff. I think that's a prime opportunity for kids to sit at home all day and uh, take State. tests. Eight ripe weeks. Just saying, just saying. But I am, I am personally, you know, as a high school teacher, I am very um, pleased to see so many of my students getting the vaccine. We've had, we actually had a vaccine clinic on our campus um, not too long ago, which was super dope. And this year with the hybrid teaching, virtual environment type of thing, I've probably had more students than, than ever, like email me about like, I can't log into class because I have like a dentist appointment um, and things of that nature. Now I'm starting to get emails about like, I couldn't make it to class because I had to go get my shot, which is a good reason, good reason, I think, to to miss class. So definitely, definitely happy about that, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, just recently we got the uh, the word of the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for ages 12 and up, which means pretty much across the board, seventh grade through 12th grade in the United States, uh, children are eligible. So, um, you know, I know there's a lot of feelings out there uh, about the vaccine, but um, one thing that is uh, pretty certain, I think at this point, is that uh, if you get sick from COVID, it's gonna be a lot worse than if you get, (laughs) you know, some initial discomfort from the vaccine. So hopefully uh, we have a lot of kids uh, ready and safe to come back in person, liberated to some extent uh, in the fall, man. Well, indeed, indeed. I'm definitely looking forward to that for sure. And I'm also looking forward to this school year wrapping up because it has been a challenge to say the least. But Jeff, we have a uh, brand new episode of All the Above right here with uh, some dope stuff on the agenda. So why don't you break it down for us? What are we learning today? Well, man, well, we got a good one for everybody, as is usually the case. Um, And today, I will say uh, we have a guest coming that's been like a few years in the making. Uh, This is a person who um, who I had the great privilege of, you know, getting to know and do some work with uh, in my time in New York. Um, She is a brilliant scholar of education, um, a professor at Columbia University Teachers College um, in English education. She has trained teachers, principals, whole school staffs, uh, community groups, districts, state uh, ed officials, um, folks from top to bottom in the education system about um, her, one of her great areas of expertise, which is around racial literacy and Um, the importance of building racial literacy in educators and in our systems and practices within education. And that is none other than Professor Yolanda Seely Ruiz, um, who is going to be here with us today, man. And, um, you know, for the last couple of years, we've been thinking about plotting on how and when to invite her. And she is finally coming on with us. And uh, it's going to be great, man. You definitely don't want to miss it. That is dope. That is dope. Dr. Celie Ruiz will be in the building. Jeff, I can't wait to ask her about 
you know, you know, she's been doing this work since way before it became, you know, quote unquote popular with, you know, the summer uprisings of last year where everybody seemed to be jumping on board the anti-racism train. She's been doing this work since long before that. And I, I can't wait to hear what she has to say about like the recent backlash we've been seeing, you know, with so much legislation passing in different states about, um, you know, banning this sort of work. Like, I, I really want to hear her perspective on that because, you know, she's been in the game for a minute doing this type of work. So definitely looking forward to that. But of course, first, we have our do now where we will take a look at recent headlines in the world of education. Stay tuned. All right, folks, now it's time for today's do now. Let's take a look at recent news and headlines in the world of education. Jeff, how are we going to do the do now today? All right, man. Well, we are coming up in, in many parts of the country, at least on the end of the school year, which means it's time to issue some grades. So we got a report card today. All right, folks, report card time. It's been a long year. Let's see. Let's see how we're doing grade wise. Um, Jeff, the first grade is a it's a D. Mm. Uh, so you're saying I passed. <laughs> is that what we're talking? Here? I guess technically, although uh, more and more schools are going to the, um, you know, A through C grade and uh, or incomplete. So. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess you passed, but you know, that's a D doesn't get you the A through G approval here in California. So you sure end up having don't. to retake that class if you're looking for admission to a CSU or a University of California campus. So, yep. so yeah, but this D actually is for diversity, Jeff. Diversity, we all love diversity. I'm sure there's no controversy here with this story. <laughs> None at all. No, yes, of everyone not. loves diversity. Yes, indeed. All right, Jeff. Yes. So this story comes to us from Ian Richardson for the Des Moines Register. This is a story about some stuff happening in Iowa. And under a new law in Iowa, five school districts will no longer be allowed to turn down open enrollment requests based on a student's socioeconomic or English language learner status. So what this law does in effect is put an end to voluntary diversity plans that five districts, um, Davenport, Des Moines, Postville, Waterloo, and West Liberty School Districts, plans that they have used to regulate open enrollment in their districts. So Republicans pushed for this change as part of a quote-unquote school choice package of efforts, and they're arguing that eliminating the diversity plans will keep students from being trapped by their socioeconomic status in districts where they don't want to be. However, school officials in these five districts say that the law will hurt the school's ability to balance enrollment in their districts and could result in students from predominantly white, wealthier families leaving their districts. Leaders in multiple school districts with diversity plans have said that more requests typically come from students in families with higher incomes and from students who are not English language learners. During an April news conference, the governor of Iowa said that she supported the bill along with other school choice efforts she proposed this year because it expands opportunities for parents to decide where to send their children. She said, quote, I think competition is a good thing. Now, Melissa Peterson, a, a government relations specialist with the Iowa State Education Association Teachers Union, which opposes the new law, says that she believes banning the diversity plans will have a negative effect on students' experiences in the five districts that have them. She said, quote, diversity is a good thing for our kids. They need to learn in an environment that frankly looks similar to the world around them. Now, Jeff, Open enrollment, you know, a lot of a lot of areas, a lot of states, a lot of districts have that. And here is a new law that effectively prevents schools from from barring open enrollment applications, which according to, you know, critics of this law, that might make it easier for higher income and wider families to flee their local school districts and send them to more suburban, more white areas. So Jeff, what are you what what are your thoughts on this? Are you are you surprised that that Diversity plans are no longer going to be allowed in these districts. Oh, man. Uh, nothing surprises me when it comes to <laughs> the manifestations of white supremacy and racism in our world, uh, Manuel. Um, and absolutely nothing surprises me that in the state of Iowa, uh, which is certainly not a bastion of progressive whiteness, um, you know, would there be uh, folks working diligently to undermine even the most limited efforts at creating intentionally diverse public schools. 
Um, so, uh, so, you know, period, end of sentence on that. I will say, Manuel, before I, before I get going on a, on a quick thing here, um, got to give a special shout out to um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, a.k.a. Um, Ida Bay Wells on Twitter, uh, because she's from Iowa. And it was actually from a tweet of hers recently where um, I first encountered this story. Um, so props to her. And, um, you know, she talked about how uh, it was programs like this that allowed her family to help ensure she had access to a high quality public education. Right. Um, and so, you know, if that isn't just a perfect microcosm of like what's at stake in this equation, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what is. Um, but I think for for maybe the, the lay person who is listening to this or, or watching, um, something that's important to note is like how these programs work, because um, I think it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? So the, the move from these conservative folks in Iowa is to say that um, districts can no longer turn down applicants based on socioeconomic status or um, language status or, th or that sort of thing. The Supreme Court has already previously um, essentially outlawed uh, race-based school integration efforts, okay, even if they are voluntary. So, um, you know, America has, has uh, a law, a set of laws that, that say not only <laughs> can, we, uh, can we not integrate um, by force, we can't integrate if you want to, okay? Um, so this would be an extension of that because what they are trying to create here is conditions where districts are saying, okay, let's try to have some diversity within our district or as students um, travel across the, the lines of neighboring districts. Um, and they, they want to try to prevent an over-concentration of like all the low-income kids in one school or all the English learners in one school because we, of course, have highly class and race and language segregated neighborhoods, right? So what the, what the folks in Iowa are doing is saying, you can't, um, you can't do that, right? You can't say no or yes to kids considering those factors. And what that is likely to create in the name of so-called school choice and in the name of so-called competition is a situation like we see in most districts around the country, which is a concentration of whiter and wealthier families um, in certain places and, and therefore concentrations of everyone else, um, students of color, low-income students, folks who are living more on the margins of society in the other schools, right? Um, and so... That's what the game is here. Um, and I think we have every reason to be <laughs> highly, highly suspicious and to assume uh, nefarious intent um, on the part of the folks who, who have pushed this policy in the state of Iowa. Yeah, man, all of that, all of that. And for me, it's, it's open enrollment. It's something that I'm still like trying to wrap my head around because when I grew up, the district that I, I, I whose schools I attended, we didn't have open enrollment. So you just went to your closest school and it was never really a thing. And then my early years teaching, I taught at a place that didn't really have open enrollment like that. And unless it was a very, very, very special program at a school. Um, but now I'm in a district that does have open enrollment and you know we have tours and we do the whole, like all the schools in, in open enrollment areas. We do the, the whole like dog and pony show about why our school's so great and why you should choose our school. And the governor here in Iowa said, you know, competition is a good thing. And you would think, I guess, I guess I see that, I guess, you know, making schools really work for, for their um, parents and their families to like send their kids there. I guess you could try to argue that that makes sense and, and works. But then what we find in places like this is that a lot of parents are making these choices not really based on the academic programs, the academic offerings there. And I bet these parents in, in Iowa that are wanting to send their school, their students to other schools, I bet if you got down to the nitty gritty and asked them why, they, you know, they would probably say something about like, oh, you know, uh, stronger test scores. And of course, we know test scores are, are not a great measure of the quality of the teaching or the learning at that school. Um, and then if you were to ask them more specifics about like the actual lessons and, and the teaching and the pedagogy, I think. I think they wouldn't have much to say because at the end of the day, a lot of these open enrollment decisions, the, a lot of these decisions about where to send your kid nationally, nationwide, have so much to do with 
the type of kids who already go to that school and your impression about those type of kids. So I teach at a school that historically has had a bad reputation and I truly, truly believe that we have one of the strongest teaching staffs around, well, in the city for sure, like in the city for sure. And whenever parents have come and toured my classroom and, and you know, they have questions about overall stuff like programs and things like that, but they never really ask about lesson plans. They don't never really ask about particular pedagogical practices or anything like that. And I always, I'm always left thinking like, you know what, they just kind of wanted to get their eyes on just the look and feel of the campus. and. We see across the nation a lot of that. A lot of that ends up being like, okay, I don't want my kid around those black and brown kids because those black and brown kids don't look as academic or they don't look as quote unquote safe, and I'm going to send them to to another place. So, yeah, open enrollment to me is just like just trash. Why don't we just work towards the closest school to you being a good quality school? Like that should be simple to me. The closest place to you. Let's ensure that's good quality. Let's not have you have to send your kids elsewhere for school because you're trying to avoid the particular demographics of, of that school. At least that's how I see it, Jeff. I don't know. I, I mean, that, this this actually would be a great topic we should take on in an upcoming episode. We should find ourselves a, you know some good guests to really dig into the policy behind this. On a personal level, I don't necessarily have a problem with um, with open enrollment, and in particular, it has been useful. Um, in some situations in cities and metro areas across the country to create some, um, you know, some measure of integration and, and diversity uh, socioeconomically, racially right. uh, in a region. Right. In fact, um, a guest we had on a few episodes back, uh, Robert Cotto out of out of Hartford, talked about a, you know, a model there that um, that has been in place for some time and, you know, is not without controversy right um, on some on some level but um, I'm not I'm not wholesale opposed uh, to to these kinds of policies I think we have to look at the motivations of, of yes. people who are pushing these policies and the yes. reality is the white power structure in Iowa is trying to further consolidate power for itself and resources for itself um, and place barriers in the way of families and communities of color to accessing um, an equal and just and fair education. And um, I think we have to like treat it as that, right? You could take something that could be a good idea and use it for, you know, for oppressive means. And I feel pretty, you know, I'm gonna need to see some evidence to the contrary in order, in order to convince me that these folks in Iowa are not, are not up to that. Um, in terms of what they're doing. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, we live in a society where uh, we, the only or one of the very few means of sort of personal uplift and social mobility that we offer systematically to everyone is public education. And so what happens in our schools in this regard is particularly high stakes. And in that sense, I think, you know, what's happening here in Iowa is deeply problematic. And, you know, my hope is that, you know, folks on the ground and in the Des Moines area are are able to organize or push back or come up with some some other creative policy solutions so that uh, this doesn't actually have an, an oppressive effect on on kids and families. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I could get with that. I could get with that. Um, but Jeff, we do have another grade, man. We do have another grade. Uh, the diversity do. stuff's going to have to wait, Jeff. <laughs> got another story. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, man, well, now that I think about it, man, our um, our two stories today, I mean, shout out to the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest, you know. Um, and uh, <laughs> our two stories today are both coming from Midwestern states and both states neighboring my home state. I think this is some kind of like... You know, the all the above universe is uh, is is speaking to us. Uh, <laughs> some something good is happening in there, I think. Um, but uh, Manuel, our our next story, our next grade um, is an I. An I. I know this one. I know this one. I for incomplete because in this mm. virtual learning environment, not all students are equitably able to access their learning, and instead of giving an F. Some school systems are giving incompletes and allowing that student extra time, like over the summer, for example, to uh, finish their class. So incomplete. 
You know, that is a fantastic answer, Manuel, uh, that I hope, um, hashtag uh, give them all A's, Dr. Manuel Rustin, um, your philosophy and approach on this question would still be true uh, <laughs> to this day um, in a highly pandemic impacted school year. However, in this particular instance, I is not for incomplete, I stands for indigenous. Um, or even more precisely in this case, um, a task force around uh, the education of indigenous students in Rapid City, South Dakota, man. So we're gonna head, we're gonna head northwest uh, from Des Moines and head on over to South Dakota. So um, let's okay. get into this story here. Um, this story comes to us uh, by Abby Wargo in the Rapid City Journal. Um, and after years of quote unquote empty promises, Rapid City Area Schools is taking action on the achievement gap between indigenous students and their white counterparts. The district has formed an indigenous education task force uh, back in February to address the educational experience, the learning environment and academic outcomes for indigenous students in the district. The task force will continue meeting until the fall of 2022, so for a full year, when a final report and recommendations on how to improve indigenous education in Rapid City will be given to the superintendent. Now, the idea for the task force came from the Title VI Indian Education Parent Advisory Council. Valeria Big Eagle, who is chairperson of the council and the task force's co-facilitator, said there have been discussions historically between the school district and the indigenous community about addressing um, the significant achievement and opportunity gaps, but, quote, we get a whole bunch of empty promises and no actions, end quote. Now, in Rapid City schools for the 2019-20 school year, only 47% of Native American students graduated from high school on time compared to 83% of whites. And only 15% of Native American students demonstrated college or career readiness compared to 53% of white students. Uh, Rapid City schools overall is 35% students of color, so perhaps more diverse than people might think of um, in South Dakota. Um, and Native American students make up the largest share of that. They are 21% of the district. Um, now, what is fascinating about this is the task force aims to push the district to incorporate indigenous ways into the education system and to have more Native representation among school personnel. Priorities include things like developing a Lakota language immersion program for kindergartners, which is set to start this fall, and expanding that type of program through grades one through five. Um, the task force's second major task will be evaluating the impact of the Ocheti Shakoan Essential Understandings, which are accredited teaching standards in the state of South Dakota, to determine how many of the lessons are taught correctly and what impact is like, and developing metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of the use of those standards. Um, the task force will also look into the district's hiring practices to ensure recruitment and retention of more indigenous staff. So, Manuel, um, I am fascinated by this story uh, partially because there's some real cool stuff that this task force seems to be working on, but also because, frankly, we have not talked a great deal with specificity about issues um, in education through the lens of looking at how indigenous students uh, specifically are served. And this particular case out of Rapid City gives us a um, really a, a, a fascinating example to dig into. So, um, Manuel, what say you about this story out of South Dakota? Yeah, I agree with your statement there. I, I don't think there's, well, we on this show certainly haven't spoken about education issues, particularly through the lens of the impact on indigenous students specifically. Um, but I think just, just in a, on a broader scale within education, we, you know, people, you throw around the, the acronym BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color, and I just feel like we, we provide just nationally as educators, a lot of lip service to indigenous students, but we don't really, really talk about um, education through the lens of the experiences of, of young indigenous folks um, enough, certainly. And Jeff, I'm gonna tell you something that I'm, I'm pretty sure you have no clue um, that, this, that, that this here factoid about your co-host is, is, is true, but, but, after all these years doing this show, Jeff, I've never brought up the fact that I, in fact, used to live in Rapid City, South Dakota what? when I was a young one. Yeah. 
I had no idea, man. <laughs> yeah, like you man. went to school out there for for yeah. I was I was in kindergarten at the time. I think I was there wow. for like a year or two. My my memories of that are are real sketchy. But um, but okay. yeah, my stepdad was in the Air Force, and there's an Air Force in Rapid City. So yep. yeah, we lived in Rapid City before moving to Sacramento. So yeah, shout out Rapid City. Shout out South Dakota. Um, I just remember very cold winters, man. Yeah, <laughs> very cold Definitely winters. Some of that, yes. Yeah, uh, man. But okay, but. It, yeah, so I guess I, I didn't know you would consider that Midwest either until you said it just now. In my head, it's like Great Plains, but like, okay, for sure. The Great Midwest Plains are represent. in the Midwest, man. Well, come on now. All right, good. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. All right, so anyways, in terms of the details of this actual story, yeah, I think um, this this is, I, I'm very glad. I'm very glad that their organizing and their activism has resulted in the creation of this task force. Long overdue, the article mentioned decades of lip service. I bet you it's been more than decades. You know, I bet you it's been since the first settlers, um, first white colonists got to South Dakota, um, that education services for indigenous folks have been um, incomplete to go back to the grade that we gave this story. So, so I'm glad that this, there's some forward motion here. I was very fascinated with the, I, the idea. I didn't realize these, these essential understandings, these learning standards were there that were rooted in, in, in indigeneity. So like these um, Ocheti Shakowin essential understandings, very fascinating to me, very fascinating to me. And I wonder if that's an area, you know, clearly they're looking into it based on what you just told us, but I wonder if that's an area where we see the lip service. Like we have this document that we worked really hard on. We had, you know, actual practitioners, actual experts put this together. What's happening in the actual classroom though? Are educators actually using these or, or, or trying to learn about them? Or is it just something that got published, but you know, doesn't really show up in, in the educational experiences of, of indigenous folks? in this area. Also, I think in terms of the overarching message here, it seems to be clear to me that some of the issues impacting South Dakota schools are similar to the issues impacting our schools here in California and elsewhere, which is to say that the standards, the testing, the pedagogical practices, the teaching staff demographics tend to reflect a very white, a very colonial mindset, and students of color do not see themselves in the curriculum, they do not see themselves in the practices, and they certainly don't see themselves in the teaching staff. So I think what the uh, the efforts of, of this task force, uh, I think their efforts are are parallel to a lot of the efforts that, that we see elsewhere when it comes to trying to make sure our schools reflect the histories and the cultures and the understandings of our, our young people, and that the teaching staff and the curriculum itself reflects the the demographics of the people that, that we are serving. So I see a lot of parallel there, Jeff. I am. I, I really hope this task force can help make the change that they know is needed. The idea of this um, Lakota dual immersion program and making sure that we're doing better hiring practices and making sure we have indigenous educators. All these things sound like great things. I really hope. I really hope they are able to achieve achieve these things and do right by the indigenous students of Rapid City, South Dakota. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think it is, it's fascinating, uh, this story, because I am not aware, personally, and I, this might just be lack of information, um, but, you know, Rapid City is certainly not a large urban area, right? But it's among the largest uh, urban centers in the state of South Dakota, for sure. And um, what we have is a district organizing itself um, and, you know, of course, there's a whole lot to be seen about implementation here, right? But like, ostensibly organizing itself to intentionally interrupt what is an entrenched set of oppressive systems and practices, right? So like the, you know, the opportunity, achievement, equity gaps that are present in Rapid City for indigenous students versus the overall student population or versus white students is uh, is as big or bigger as the gaps for black students or Latinx students that we see in many other parts of the country, right? And so there, there is, I think, in, in all facets of American life, a lot of erasure of indigenous people, right? Um, oh, they were here and they're gone, right? Um, and it's really fascinating to take a look at a um, at a state where there is a significant indigenous population and a community where there's a large population that is attending the public schools, right? So this is not 
um, you know, a, a tribal school system, right? Um, like on a reservation or that sort of thing where there's more like sovereignty over what happens. Um, this is in the, you know, the public school system. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting, um, you know, kind of case study to see like what happens when we organize around this. Um, and I have to say, man, well, my mind was blown when I saw these um, Ocheti Shakoan essential understandings is a set of teaching standards that is like accredited, approved within the state, right? So you can yeah. find them from the state website. Um, and I was, my mind was blown, man. My, honestly, my first reaction was like, I need to like hit up Goldie Muhammad and be like, have you seen this? <laughs> like they did this in South Dakota of yeah. all places. And you know, maybe I'm out of the loop, Manuel, and other states are doing this left and right. And I'm just like, someone didn't, I didn't read that chapter of the book in grad school. <laughs> um, but I was like, can you, I mean, imagine Manuel, if there was a set of Chicano teaching standards in California. Or there's a set of black teaching standards here in California. Critical race like, theory, Jeff. Critical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. So first of all, you know these these folks would be coming out the woodwork up in arms about. Oh yeah. You know uh, the white lady tears would be filling up the room at this point. But uh, I, like honestly, I, it's an incredible, incredible uh, thing that this document exists. Yeah. Now, as someone who's not, you know, I'm not. Um, of the Lakota or Dakota, uh, you know, communities. I don't know what the word on the ground about are these essential understandings like real cool and everybody loves them or do people think they're kind of a cop out? I have no idea. But all I could say is like the fact that they exist yeah, man. is a mind blowing thing. Yeah. And we need to like learn more about this. And, um, and the concept at least could be groundbreaking, I think, within the um, within the field of education and the fact that they're looking to test and see how are they being implemented and hold districts accountable for implementing a totally different cultural lens on teaching is amazing, man. So I'm I mean, who knew South Dakota was <laughs> was going to be like a groundbreaking place for like transformative culturally responsive pedagogy, man. But it, it could be. Yeah, possibly, possibly. I, I'm not too familiar with them either. This was very surprising to me. I, you know, I hope we don't get a bunch of comments and messages under this, like, well, you're talking about those standards. Those are trash. Those are so trash. Because maybe they are. Yeah. Maybe they're not really reflective of of the communities that we think um, they are reflective of. But yeah, it looks, it was just even the concept, like you said, even the concept of having these essential understandings um, rooted in a different cultural lens is like kind of mind-blowing to me kind of yes, mind-blowing especially totally, adopted by the state totally. yeah so yeah and that state of all states man. yeah man yes <laughs> yeah. exactly exactly so all right learn something new today jeff i learned something yes. new i hope yeah. i hope our viewers and listeners did as well but now folks it's, it's about time for our seminar all right so stay tuned for that we have dr yolanda Seely ruiz in the building you don't want to miss it stay tuned Hey, OTA family, this is Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher, just checking in with you for a second, just to reiterate the importance of leaving us a little review if you are listening to the podcast on the go. Those reviews really go a long way. Five stars would be very much appreciated. If you could write something up, we would love that too. And if you do, I mean, send us a screenshot of it. We'll send you back a all of the above sticker for your laptop or notebook or whatever you want to use it for. All right, folks, we love y'all. Let's get back to the show. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. Thanks so much for joining us. And I am absolutely thrilled to have today an amazing, incredible guest, none other than Dr. Yolanda Seely Ruiz, professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Seely Ruiz, welcome to All the Above. Oh my goodness, thank you for having me on All the Above. Yeah, well, folks, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Seely Ruiz. Um, she is a fascinating figure in education. She is an award-winning associate professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. Her research focuses on racial literacy in teacher education, black girl literacies, and black and Latinx male high school students. She is a sought-after speaker on issues of race, culturally responsive pedagogy, and diversity. 
Dr. Sula Ruiz works with K-12 and with higher education school communities to increase their racial literacy knowledge and move towards more equitable school experiences for Black and Latinx students. Dr. Sula Ruiz appeared in Spike Lee's Two Fists Up, We Gonna Be All Right, a documentary about the Black Lives Matter movement and the campus protests at the University of Missouri. Her co-authored book with Dr. Detra Prince Dennis, titled Advancing Racial Literacies in Teacher Education Toward Activism for Equity in Digital Spaces, has just been published. And she has also uh, has a new collection of poetry, which will be out this summer, titled The Peace Chronicles. Dr. C. Louise is a graduate of NYU and earned her PhD in English Education, Curriculum, and Technology at Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, welcome, Dr. C. Louise. We are so excited to have you, and I'm going to kick it over to Manuel for our first question. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for taking the time out for, for our show. And we are big fans of yours and big fans of your work. And I myself really loved your appearance on the Black Gaze podcast. So shout out to, to Black Gaze. And um, thank you so much for, for taking time to, to be here in our space right now on all of the above. And, um, you know, we, want, we just want to start with the, you know, the, the realm within which you are truly um, an expert is this, this uh, idea of racial literacy and teaching about racial literacy. And we're wondering if you could help us to uh, explore, like, how do you understand the work of, of teaching about racial literacy in schools? And then the, the, the larger work of, of using that to help transform our, our racist structures throughout society. Mm. Well, first of all, Jeff and Manuel, I want to thank you so much for having me. Indeed, it is my honor when you talk about being a fan. I'm a fan of your work. I'm a fan of this show. Uh, Y'all have been doing this for years. And so I just want to say that I'm grateful to finally, you know, land a spot to be in community with you. Well, in terms of racial literacy, you know, here are the facts. This country, probably the globe, but particularly this country has never been good at the truth, never been good at talking about the deep impact of racism, although we have 400 years of history of it. Because each time we begin to have a conversation, you know, there is white fragility that happens. There is, and, and, and also, you know, it is a triggering um, topic. It is um, hurtful you know, for BIPOC people as well, to constantly have to talk about race, to constantly have to affirm their humanity in the face of inhumanity. And so for me, quite simply, racial literacy is being able to have constructive conversations about race and the impact of racism as it lives in our own lives, but certainly, and I wanna say really most importantly in schools, because everyone goes through the schooling system the schools are an opportunity to build racial literacy and try to have a different world than the world that we're seeing now. Yeah, uh, I, that resonates so much um, with, you know, I think a lot of what we talk about and structure conversations about um, here on the show. And, um, you know, part of what I find so fascinating about you and your work, uh, Dr. Celia Ruiz, is um, you know, living at this uh, at this space where you are both working with schools in the field and also training the next generation of teachers, of education policymakers, um, and really helping to shape the the, the practitioners of the future. Mm. And so, I'm wondering if you can share with us some of your reflections on what might need to change in teacher education at a at a larger scale, um, or educator training more broadly at a larger scale, in order to actually bring into existence this uh, you know this sort of vision for anti-racist education, anti-racist schooling that I think more and more people are talking about today. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's an incredible question. Um, so thank you so much for that, Jeff. I, you know, I do have a couple of ideas. I do feel completely blessed to uh, see it for, like across the spectrum. And I'm also with young people as well. I tend to be in uh, high schools um, as well, right? So. What I believe needs to change just fundamentally are the teacher education programs. The teacher education programs that turns out teachers, again, we don't talk about race. We also don't give teachers an opportunity to do what I call the archeology span of the self, that self work 
uh, for you to, uh, for the teacher to really dig deep in terms of their biases, their stereotypes, um, their understandings around issues of race, but also class, sexuality, and so forth. So, you know, teacher education programs, they, they have to find themselves guilty in this because, you know, they have the one diversity course or you take a history of black education course, maybe. Um, and then you're expected to go into schools and be around diverse students when you've taken one diversity course. And it all depends on the fidelity of that professor. Are they racially conscious? Have they developed their racial literacy? So that's how it's repeated. So there needs to fundamentally be an overhaul, I think, where issues of race and class and gender need to be talked about across, regardless of whether you're going to, you're training to be a math teacher, a humanities teacher, it doesn't matter, you'll be dealing with children. And so there has to be more than that one diversity class. There has to be more than just one sociology class. There has to really be teacher education classes that relate teaching to issues of race and racism and inequity in schools. For teachers to be, to have that sophisticated conversation, to know how inequality has manifested in policy and practices and starting with the beliefs, the beliefs of principals, of teachers, the beliefs of themselves, right? In terms of how they grew up. So if they don't get an opportunity to do that kind of excavation, if they don't get an opportunity to examine their biases, their racist beliefs, in their teacher ed programs, when are they going to do it? And that's why this season has popped off so much over the pandemic with schools suddenly like having to be woke because um, the teachers don't have it. And so now it, we're depending on professional learning while the teachers have been teaching 10, 15 years. And really what it is is professional unlearning. We're actually trying to get them to unlearn the things that they've been believing in. And that's a lot of work. You know, that's a lot of work to unlearn something. Yeah, I am wondering, um, I love that professional unlearning. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to steal that from you. Um, the, uh, you use the phrase archaeology of the self. Um, and I'm wondering maybe if you could um, give us just a little bit of insight into like, what, what do you mean by, by archaeology of the self? What does that look like for educators out there who are trying to find a way to do this work in their context? Mm, yes, archaeology of the self is one of the six components that I've theorized as the racial literacy as racial literacy development. So there's critical love, there's critical humility, there's critical reflection. The word critical is important because that's a nod to the things that we often don't talk about, like race, class, gender. There's also historical literacy, really asking teachers or those who engage in racial literacy development to understand how our uh, nation historically has been shaped and also how communities have been shaped. Like my community in the South Bronx, it just didn't become like that. It was purposely, it was, you know, in terms of architect, it was, arche what, what do you call it? Um, architecturally designed to be uh, the community that it was, to be under-resourced, right? And um, people think, oh, well, they live in that community. They just don't want to work. They just don't want to do this. No, but history has had has its handprint on the way some communities are affluent and others are not. And so schools within those communities, people have to understand how then uh, resources are impacted based on the communities that they're in. So there's a historical literacy of understanding uh, uh, our broader society, but also then understanding the communities and then a history of the school, right? Who were the principals before then? Who were the teachers before them? Do they understand the history of the community in connection to the school? Who are the parents that they should be talking to? Who are the power brokers in that community, right? And then there's archeology span of the self. Archeology span of the self is using the self to do the deep work of critical humility, critical love, historical literacy, critical reflection. And once people engage, and it's a cyclical motion, once they engage and continue to engage, my hope is that there will be interruption, that you will interrupt yourself in terms of your racist thinking. You will interrupt practices that harm children. You will interrupt policies that harm children. 
So it is, while, while it is heavily theorized, it is also really a theory that moves directly to action. Because once you see and you hear something, if you're a racially developed person, you will interrupt that. But you have to do the self work to understand where it lives in you so you know what you're interrupting. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that resonates really, really strongly with me as, as a teacher, because, you know, that historical literacy part, um, you know, my students, we, my students were, we're in a corner of Pasadena that has been uh, historically marginalized and, and long history of, of redlining and Jackie Robinson went to our school, Octavia Butler, a lot of, wow. a lot of greats went to our school. Wow. And in teaching about that and in helping students understand sort of the, the neighborhood composition of Los Angeles and the history of racism, um, overt and, and uh, covert racism in Los Angeles and helping them understand these things, you see this, this awakening and this awareness and then yes. talking to teachers about that it's, it's, it, I marvel at how little teachers know about a lot of those histories. And, you know, I'm reminded of the conversations we've had on the show with a few directors of teacher education. And we've been very fortunate to have Dr. Patina Shea, um, who I believe you're familiar yeah, with. She's, she's wonderful. Phenomenal. And, and um, Dr. Christina Villarreal, Dr. Oh v from, gosh, from Harvard yes. and Yes. Dr. Uh, Emma Hippolito from from UCLA, and I see I see these parallels between what you're saying we we need to do for our next generation of teachers and and what they're doing in their programs, but there aren't you know there aren't enough programs doing that right now, and we, we certainly need more of that. And you would think, based on last summer's reckoning against racial injustice and the move for more and more folks to to talk about and to learn and to um, have discussions about um, systemic racism mm -hmm. and all that. You would think the movement would be um, would be there for for this type of growth, but we're seeing this recent backlash, this this really heavy backlash that um, is truly like impacting myself as like a history teacher. I, I'm I'm right. realizing the lessons I've taught about uh, systemic racism. You know, in certain states, that sort of stuff is being outlawed, and and we're seeing these bills to ban critical race theory. We, we're seeing this legislation to ban 1619 Project, and yep. we're seeing things like the 1776 Commission pop up to, to uphold these racist myths about, about the United States. So we're wondering from your perspective, as we see this, this backlash against these kind of conversations that, that you're saying we need to have and that, that you know, a lot of us are having, what are the next steps for for schools and for education policymakers in the wake of of this like really strong backlash against this forward forward movement? Mm, thank you, Manuel. You know, I've been following all of this, and um, you know, since our people, when I say our, I'm talking about indigenous folks, black folks, folks of Latin descent, have been in this country. It has been a tug of war. It has been a push and pull. And I think that we're very much in that moment right now. And when I think about all of the um, initiatives against equity and justice and humanity that you just mentioned, I'm thinking of the pull, you know, in this tug of war is the Biden-Harris executive order, you know, for equity and justice. Now that's now hitting at the federal agencies, meaning that any federal agency has now been ordered to look at its practices to make sure that they're equitable, um, to make sure that they are um, not uh, doing what they've always been doing, particularly with so-called, the, the language that's used as underrepresented groups. So that is, I think Biden came in in January and immediately put that into effect because of all of the trauma that Trump had created in trying to shut down critical race theory, saying horrible things about you know, the 1619 Project directly about <laughs> Nicole Hannah-Jones and about the project. I mean, what a bully, right? And so th the sad thing is so much had already gone in motion Meaning even before he spoke, as soon as he came into the White House, his task was to unravel all of that. And so there were uh, things that were already positioned. So even when 2019, uh, the 400 year commemoration of 1619 hit, there were already things in motion for something like a 1619 to come in and be criticized. So having said that, with Biden doing this in 2020, January, he's given a six month window for these federal agencies to show something different. But we know that it's going to take time to trickle down because we have to then identify all of the states and all of the areas 
where uh, Trump's rollback of what Obama tried to do uh, has been impacted. So what, what I'm saying is I think that we're in a moment that we've always been in. It's two steps forward, it's one back. And I think that perennially, because there's so many people afraid of true progress, because they're afraid of what they're going to lose, because they and their folks have been on top for so long, it's frightening for them to think about what they might lose if true equity happens. But when you look at those of us who are warriors, who are just fighting to thrive and to survive, we don't have a choice but to keep going. So I think that we're in this tug of war that will be perennial, at least certainly in our lifetime. And each time the political football is passed from Democratic to Republican, um, it, we're going to, again, make some steps forward. And then depending on who's in office, it's going to be some steps back. That is perhaps what saddens me most. But at the same time, that is also what invigorates my work because I know that we can never stop because they don't stop. Mm. Yeah, uh, no, they certainly do not. <laughs> um, What's that me, song, ever... Can't Stop, Won't Stop? That's the name of <laughs> Jeff Chang's book too. You know, I'm a, I'm yeah. a, I'm a chick of the, the hip hop era. Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Like that is like white supremacy. Can't Stop, Won't Stop. It has 400 years of, you know, just benefits. People are not gonna give that up automatically. Even those folks who claim to be woke, when you really start digging down and asking them to go deep and stand up for equity, you see the fear come out. I've seen it in thousands of teachers. They are afraid. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that resonates so much uh, with, uh, you know, with me and what I've seen and what, you know, Manuel and I have, uh, have talked a lot about um, here as well. And, you know, one of the great pleasures I think that we have in doing the show is having a community of educators out there who are all, you know, in different locations, different, you know, parts of the country and the world trying to push for and lead for equitable anti-racist practice and systems in their context, whether that's a district or a school or a state system, wherever it might be. Um, and finding a community uh, mm -hmm. to have support um, in doing the work of confronting and getting yes. to that place where people are afraid and getting to that place where they're going to experience pushback. And I'm wondering if you can share some wisdom from, from your own experience with folks in our audience who are who are out there like, I'm trying to do this, but I'm getting the resistance or, you know, I'm getting the, um, the passive aggressive, uh, you know, slowdown of my work and those sorts of things. What's maybe some wisdom you can share for them um, as folks are, you know, are, are sort of ramming their head against what can feel like a brick wall sometimes, mm. um, but also recognize that this is critically important work that we can't abandon. Mm. Jeff, Manuel, whew, these questions. <laughs> the first thing I would say is I would think about Uncle Jimmy, that's James Baldwin, of course, in his 1963 talk to teachers, and allow me to paraphrase, where he told teachers, if you are going to advocate, or in this case, he was talking about Negro children, Black children, you must expect there will be fierce resistance. So the first thing is to remind those allies, those co-conspirators, those folks in the movement that resistance is part of it. That's almost a, a way of you, let, of you understanding that you're on the track, right? That you are actually doing the work because you are receiving that resistance. The second thing I would say is Jeff, what you mentioned, find your community. You cannot do this alone, I promise you. And if you are trying to do it alone, if you're trying to be that Lone Ranger in your classroom, the only one in the school, you think I can close my door and do all of this. No, eventually the resistance is going to be so thick that it actually can burn you out. And so it's important that you not only identify those folks in the school community, but also outside of your community. You know, I think about this work that I'm doing if it is not for, you know, Bettina Love and Goldie Muhammad and the Queens of the Black Gays podcast, who are their own activists doing their own, like, like you and Manuel, this is activism, 
right? This is building community. We have to have each other because when it hits, I was just talking to uh, Godi this morning. She was doing a session and there were very hateful comments, you know, in her session while she's speaking. You have to be able to have someone to go to, to share that, to screenshot it and that you can release it together. So that's the second thing that I would say. The third thing I would say is definitely you have to practice self-care. And what I mean by self-care, it's not always burning incense and taking hot baths. Those things are nice too, but you have to have some sort of mindfulness practice, some sort of prayer practice, eat well, drink water, like take care of your vessel because if physically you're not strong, it's going to be very difficult to push forward psychologically and mentally and emotionally because this work is super hard. So those would be the top things, you know, that I would share. Number one, expect the resistance and let it keep you uh, focused. Number two, find your community and rely on them. And number three, take care of the self so that you can be mentally, emotionally, and physically strong for the fight. We know now that despite all this work of fighting against racial injustice and despite the resistance and despite just the just everything that we're up against, there's also a, a pandemic happening right cool. now that has greatly impacted our schools and our classrooms. And there's so much talk about reimagining education and, and that term sort of seems to have been co-opted in certain spaces and, and this, these discussions about learning loss and mm. trying to catch students up because they've missed so much during this pandemic. And in the face of all this, we're wondering what, what would you say schools should look like? What's your vision of a, a reimagined school system for this fall, considering, considering all these discussions about catching students back up and all that? Oh, first of all, I don't buy into that language. Uh, and when you talk about like rethinking, reimagining schools, you know, I kind of freedom dream in an Afrofuturistic kind of way. So that, that's one answer, which might be for another show um, in terms of when, when a child walks into a school, you know, they should see a reflection of their community. And I don't mean just BIPOC folk for BIPOC children. I mean, I want to have conscious BIPOC uh, uh, BIPOC folk in there, right? Not those who uh, subscribe to, to whiteness and a lot of these, um, I don't know, beliefs about what black and brown children should have. So, but, but to think about what should children see when they go back in September, I've been thinking about this, that literally when children walk in the door, I wanna know what they're hearing. Is there music playing? Is there a team of teachers and the principal greeting them at the door? Are there balloons? Because you know what? It is a celebration for life. It is a party that they have survived um, in the sense that they were not taken up by the COVID because we know that children lost their lives too. Certainly there are many of us who have lost friends and family members. So it should be for me, a celebration of life. Here we are having a chance to reconvene. Now, what happens after that is most important. It's not about learning loss, but what did we learn and gain from sitting still in the COVID? We know that the inequalities that we know existed, suddenly the world started seeing it. Children who uh, have various abilities that depend on technology, children, some children who don't have any technology at all. Like we started seeing everything. So, I want to ask, I want to reverse that question. And I want to ask teachers and superintendents and principals, what did you learn? What would you like to do differently in terms of inequity? All of the inequity that was exposed. How are you going to have different resources? How are you going to advocate for different resources? How are you going to begin to hire more teachers of color? How are you going to advocate for a different type of curriculum and you know, stop with this well, Eurocentric curriculum? Can you advocate to your district to say, you know, let's get in uh, Goldie Muhammad's model. Let's get in, uh, you know, Bettina Love's ATN. Like we sat still for a year, y'all, but we were very active. And the one thing that online spaces allowed us to do was to see who's doing the work. So there's proof that there are alternatives. So instead of focusing on learning loss, what they didn't get, Children didn't just freeze their brain. And quite honestly, some of the stuff that we were teaching them was not of use for them in the first place. So how do we unlearn this language, 
And how do we relearn when you say reimagine what it can look like for them different in terms of curriculum, pedagogically, what can we inspire our teachers to think about differently? And in terms of leadership, how can you treat your teachers with more respect and not just see them according to how they can make their students' test scores go up? And since we're talking about tests, I wanna see that gone completely. I wanna see leaders of districts be strong enough to advocate to their state ed departments that these tests are not working for the students nor the teachers. And for those of us in the academy that might have some influence at the White House or folks that can make a change in policy to be of one accord, that we're all saying that these tests are not measuring anything and they're not serving us. So that's what I would like to see, just very specifically a change in curriculum. I wanna see different resources allocated. I wanna see teachers thinking differently about their pedagogy, leaders thinking differently about the effect of, of, of exams and tests on the students and the teachers in their schools. I want to see some courage. Wow, you, uh, you are speaking my language uh, there, uh, Dr. C. Louise. Um, some courage, some flipping of the narrative from you know, learning loss to what should be the stance of any educator, which is who are the students I am teaching and what assets and strengths do they bring to the school and to the classroom and how can I use those to help support and further uh, their learning. So let's hope that um, the wisdom that you just shared with us will carry the day in policy conversations that are that are rapidly taking place in every state and district across the country right now, um, and that we can move away from from this you know sort of institutionalization of deficit mindsets about our students and about the communities that we serve. All right, so Dr. Celie Ruiz, before we let you go, just wanna give you a few moments to tell us about some of your exciting work and for folks in our audience, if they're interested in learning more about what you're up to and what you've been writing. Um, I know you've got a new book that is just out and another one coming here in the next few months. Uh, so tell us about <laughs> um, what Dr. Yolanda Celie Ruiz has been cooking up. Oh, thank you. Well, first, I want to say I'm so excited that I recently had a policy brief on racial literacy, what we've been talking about today, published by the National Council of Teachers of English. And that's been making its rounds. And I'm super excited to lend my voice to the policy world, particularly around teacher education. And, you know, there is a new book. <laughs> I'm excited about it because it's with my dear sister, friend, and colleague, Deitra Price Dennis, Advancing Racial Literacies in Teacher Education, Activism for Equity in Digital Spaces. We want teachers to get it right. We want them to build their racial literacies, but we also want them to think about technology in perhaps a different way that they have been. It is not the carrot that you dangle in front of the child, do your work, and now you get to play with the iPad. No, the iPad is the work. Uh, the uh, TikTok is not just a, a space where kids um, figure out fashion sense. It's where they go for belonging. And it is also where they are actively gathering in terms of their digital activism and their political mindset. So we want teachers to have an understanding of that. So that's dropping Teachers College Press. Thank you for the mention of the new book. Uh, it is somewhat of a sequel a little bit to love from the vortex. When you're in the vortex, from that comes peace. And so the Peace Chronicles will be dropping this summer. Thank you so much. I'm excited about all of the projects and I just want them to push forward love and equity. That's what I'm trying to be about in this life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, folks, you, you heard it here. Go out uh, and get uh, the amazing work of Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz. Um, we have been so privileged to have you with us today. Thank you again. And folks, we've reached the end of today's seminar. Next up is our class dismissed. Stay tuned. Hey folks, thanks for watching all the above. We really appreciate you and we need your help. We're trying to get the word out about all the above to everyone. Here's what you can do. Go to aotashow.com, that's our website, 
All the links to all of our content is there. You can share our stuff on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. Send the links to friends, colleagues, educators you know who could benefit from this type of show. Help us spread the word about all the above. Thanks. Enjoy the show. All right, folks, it's time for some shout outs in the segment we like to call Class Dismissed. So Jeff, before we get out of here, who are we shouting out today? Well, man, well, today we have a, um, a special uh, heartfelt shout out, a, uh, a message of happy trails and, um, and resting in peace and power to, um, I think someone that's fair to say is a, a legend of education, a legend among black educators here in the state of California. That is the late, great Irene B. West. Now, Miss West, uh, to many out there, uh, you know, just watching the news and that sort of thing, you may know her as the mother of uh, one Professor Cornell West, uh, which is, you know, certainly notable um, for the headlines. However, folks more locally here in California, or especially in the Sacramento area, um, would know her as um, a legend of education. Now, Miss West was a trailblazing educator in Northern California. Um, she was uh, a person who gave years and years of service to California's fifth largest school district in Elk Grove Unified. She was the district's first ever black teacher and served as a principal at seven, count them up, seven district schools over a nearly 30 year career. Now, well, this is of course, I know uh, close to your heart um, because it's also close to your home. Um, so what say you about the late, great uh, Irene West? Yeah, man, I actually attended schools in Elk Grove Unified, so. I used to live in Rapid City, going back to the do now, and uh, I attended high school and middle school and elementary school. I don't know why I went in that order, but in Elk Grove Unified. So, so yeah, she's a real legend, man, a real legend. Three decades in the game. Um, she, she's, you know, blazed trails for folks. Like there's an elementary school named after her in El Grove Unified. And the slogan for that school is go to West, go to college. And so much of that school's identity is rooted around uh, some of her philosophy. So the staff there, they wear shirts that have her favorite proverb on it. And, that, and those shirts read, if you can't be a highway, then just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you win or you fall, be the best of whatever you are. Truly amazing trailblazer in education. Shout out to Irene B. West forever, rest in peace. And yeah, man, a legend, man, a legend. So shout out to Irene B. West for sure. Indeed. All right, folks, well, we have come to the end of today's episode. Thanks so much for joining us. Before you go, make sure, uh, scroll on down to the bottom of your podcast app. Give us those five stars. If you're watching on YouTube, give us that thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. Share this with your friends, colleagues, folks who can benefit from these amazing conversations we have here on all the above, on all your socials, and uh, help spread the word about our show. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>